All right, here we go. Well, thank you for coming on to our webinar tonight. It's on TikTok. Uh, kind of tried to use a play of words. Um, we are actually going to be talking about ticks. I'm not going to be dancing or doing little skits for you, but we are going to talk about ticks, which are uh, causing, you know, their, their reason of concern. Um, throughout the United States, uh, there's issues that ticks cause. And the best thing that we're going to talk about today is prevention of these causes. Uh, we don't want to have uh, anybody gets sick, sometimes some of these diseases they pass on are debilitating for long periods of time. But we're going to go ahead and talk about some of these uh, species that are up here on our screen. Like I said earlier, if you have any questions, please pose them in the question and answer function. Uh, we would love to hear your questions and hopefully answer them by the end of the night. So let's get started. I am going to go to our presenter, who is Joe Ellis, she's originally from the UK. Uh, she grew up and spent uh, in near Peak District National Park and spent many hours in nature and with animals. Uh, she's focused her career in education and currently she works for the Bay Area Lyme, uh, which is an organization there that helps get the word out about tick-borne illnesses through education, writing blogs and articles and supporting organizations, uh, national Biobank program. Uh, tonight she joins us at the recommendation of our assistant chief. Uh, I guess she knows him. So thank you, uh, Chief Kirshner, for referring Joe Ellis to us. And I look forward to having this webinar. We did a dry run the other day and the information you should receive will be very beneficial to your time outdoors. So welcome, Joe. Really quick, I'd like to go ahead and uh, start with this poll, as you know. I have some pre-made here. And what I'm going to do is make sure that the panelists can participate. And here we go, poll number one. As you know, these are always have some jokes associated with them, but the poll question is, which one of these ticks is most likely to carry Lyme disease? Either A, B, or C. And the joke is, why are jokes about ticks unpleasant? They get under your skin. Somebody said it's not funny already. Come on. <clears throat> All right. Thank you for your participation. I look forward to seeing your responses. I can see that half of you are incorrect. Oh, I'm even uh, more incorrect. Wow, here we go. I'm going to give it three, two, one, end the poll, and I'm going to share the results. So the question is, which one of these ticks is most likely to carry Lyme disease? And the answer, in fact, is, what is it, Joe? B. B, all right. That is the Western black-legged tick. Uh, a is the dog tick, which you commonly see. And C is not actually a tick. It is a ked, a deer ked, which you may think looks like a tick and are present on a lot of deer. If you're a big game hunter, you might see those. Uh, if you notice, they only have six legs versus the ticks, which have uh, eight. And 81% thought my jokes were okay, or my joke. All right, let's do the next question. How do I get to the next one? Excuse me. Um, more questions to stop sharing. Go to number two, number two question, number two slide. All right, have you ever had to remove an attached tick? Yes or no? And the joke is, what does a tick and the Eiffel Tower have in common? They are both parasites, parasites. <laughs> All right, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't launch it. Now you should see it, I'm a little rusty. Here we go. <laughs> And the reason I put this graphic up there is so that you know uh, how not to grab a tick and how to grab a tick if you're gonna be removing one. It's very important that you reach for the head of the tick and not try to squeeze it mid body. So here we go. I'm gonna end it in three, two, one. And share the results. So, <clears throat> 85% of our audience has been had to remove an attached tick. 
Uh, 4% were lucky not to have to have gone through that. And 81% uh, thought my joke was funny. Thank you, appreciate that. Let's go to the next slide. And the one last question. And I will launch it. So last question is, have you or someone you know ever been diagnosed with Lyme disease? Uh, the joke is, what do you call a tick living on the moon? A lunatic. I'll tell you, there were a lot of tick jokes on the internet, uh, some of them not so clean. Um, so I picked the cleanest and non uh, offensive jokes that I could find. So if you're offend offended by any of those, I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna close this in three, two, one. And the poll, share the results. So 54% of you um, do know somebody or have been diagnosed with Lyme disease and 46 have not. Very, very nice that you don't know somebody with Lyme disease. Uh, it's it's a, not a fun one. And 96% like my joke. Well, that one I thought was the worst, but it got the best reviews. So anyways, uh, if you look at the graphic, you can kind of see um, high areas of um, Lyme disease are mostly in the Northeast. You see that, uh, the dis how, how the prevalence of it is. This was for 2022. Uh, you can see where the problem areas really exist. So if you ever visit those areas, be highly aware, make your precautions for preventing tick bites. So I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to turn this over to Joe Ellis. If you guys can, like I said, use your question and answer function, we'll try to answer those questions before the end of the night. So thank you and take it away, Joe. Thank you, Sean. Hi, everybody. It's uh, it's great to uh, see you all. Well, not for you, but at least be here. Thank you very much for giving up your evening and coming out tonight. And uh, as Sean said, I work for the Bay Area Lyme Foundation, uh, which is based here in California. And we're the largest public funder of Lyme disease research in the country. Um, so why are we talking about ticks? We're talking about ticks because anybody who is involved in outdoor pursuits um, here in California, um, whether you're camping or hiking or mountain biking, trail running, fishing, hunting, whatever it is you're doing, you're actually putting yourself at risk potentially to be exposed to tick-borne diseases. So you need to learn to be alert for ticks. You're here tonight or watching this later on YouTube, and uh, that's a great thing because you want to educate yourself about the dangers of tick bites. We're going to talk a bit about what to do if you or a friend or a family member um, or someone that you're out in nature with uh, is bitten. And also talk a bit about how to advocate for yourself um, with medical professionals and talk about the importance of early treatment and why Lyme and diagnosing for Lyme um, is a particularly challenging endeavor for the medical profession uh, at this time. So um, in the spirit of things, I'm gonna start out with a joke, which is, I found this online and I did put the copyright in there, but people are always saying, oh my gosh, you know, it's supposed to be a huge tick explosion this year. And they go, ah, oh, well, you know, we haven't seen any yet. Here they are, <laughs> standing on the top of the tick. That's kind of how it feels when you're out and about in nature. But um, let's just talk a little bit about the research. Um, what you're seeing here, as Sean showed you on that previous graphic, is that we know that the northeastern United States is particularly problematic for Lyme and tick-borne diseases. But we actually conducted a, a citizen science project back in 2018. And what we discovered uh, was that people sent us ticks from all over the country. And we were actually able to establish that there were many counties in the United States where um, ticks had not been reported and recorded uh, by the CDC. So 
this science, you can find this on our website, but it was published and we found ticks in 83 counties around the country in 24 states, previously undetected. We collected 21,000 ticks from 49 states, just people like you going in, out and about in nature, maybe even gardening or hiking or whatever, and they would either find a tick outside on themselves or come home later and having had a shower, discover they had a tick and they sent them to us and we tested all of them. Um, and what was really fascinating was that we discovered that all three life stages of the three major tick species that are very problematic in terms of vectoring disease to humans uh, were actually infected. And um, this was our team at uh, Northern Arizona uh, State University, and they collected, they were just like inundated with packages and got all kinds of things, not, not just ticks, I think they received scorpions, heads, spiders, and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's really important what Sean talked about is being able to actually recognize what a tick even looks like, because a lot of people out there are confused. But in terms of California, what um, we discovered was that in actually 42 of California's 58 counties, we did find infected ticks. And the tick that we're really going to focus on today, and I'll come back to this tick, is the Western black-legged tick. This is the one that's most problematic. Currently, we have three counties where we haven't found uh, the Western black-legged tick, which is um, Modoc, Alpine, and Mono counties. But that doesn't mean to say they aren't there. It's just that we haven't elected them or found them from those particular counties. Why is it that tick populations are growing and their range is expanding? Well, one of the things is that ticks are always on the move. And for people like yourself who are out and about, especially those of you who um, are out hunting and fishing, you're very aware of our migratory bird patterns, especially out here in California with the Pacific Flyway. And it's important to really think about which we know that all of these things are interconnected. So pathogen, which essentially is the catch-all phrase for bacteria or viruses or parasites, these are on the move all the time and are being uh, redistributed and reinfected and moving all the time within uh, our world. So let's talk about what some of these path pathogens are. Um, you can see here, these are actually engorged ticks. And you can see that they're here on this head of this mouse or vole. Um, they are often found on squirrels, but here you can see this bird is covered in engorged ticks. And these uh, bacteria, viruses, and parasites are actually in California this is the blood of these particular small wild mammals that are the reservoir for these particular pathogens, particularly the Borrelia burgdorferi pathogen, which is the Lyme disease pathogen. And what happens is that the ticks get infected when they feed on the blood of these infected creatures, um, because the ticks have to get a blood meal in order to be able to then um, what we describe as molting, they have to change and move to the next stage of their life cycle. And they can't do that until they've had a blood meal. So they take that blood meal and then they become infected. And that's how the bacteria that causes Lyme ends up getting transmitted to humans from these animal reservoirs. The ticks are essentially just the bridge between these small mammals and ourselves as humans. Really quick, uh, Joe, yeah. were those were those ticks on those animals the black legged variety or yes, those were black legged ticks. Those were the Western black legged tick. Yes. Thank you. So um, this would have been a cool thing to ask in your poll, actually, Sean. Like, what's the life cycle of a tick? Mm -hmm. And we know that it's probably around two years, but some uh, evidence suggests it could be as long as three. And 
it's really kind of uh, cool to think about how this whole thing works. Eggs are laid in the leaf litter, the top la layer of uh, the dirt and the soil um, out here in California. And these hatch into larvae. And then, as I said, the larvae, they tend to just feed on the small mammals. So, you know, birds, reptiles, squirrels, voles, mice, etc. cetera. Um, and then the, when they've had that blood meal, if they fed on a squirrel or a wild mammal that happens to have the bacteria in their blood, then when they molt to the next life stage of their life cycle, that's when they become most of them become infected. And although we have, as I showed earlier, proven that some larvae are actually born infected, the vast majority of them become infected after they've taken this first blood meal. So then this nymph or kind of teenage tick, this is a really problematic tick. These are the ones that come out in the springtime. They will then again feed on a small mammal, or they may feed on larger mammals if you come into contact with them, like humans or dogs or raccoons or uh, those larger mammals. And then they're going to take another blood meal and become an adult, an adult female or male pig. And at this point, again, they can feed on either uh, large mammals or the small mammals, etc. This is, again, a problematic stage of the life cycle. Then the male and the female adult ticks, they mate. The adult tick dies. And then the female tick then feeds once more. She has to have a blood meal in order to be able to have the egg laying trigger. So again, they just are very opportunistic feeders and they are just feeding in order to complete their life cycle. There's nothing nefarious in this at all. Joan, um, somebody, yeah. somebody realized that uh, the larva only has six legs. They probably picked up on that. And uh, yeah, yeah. they wanted to know if it was true or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very strange. These are arachnids. Uh, ticks are related to like mites and spiders more, more closely in terms of their particular um, family of species, but when they hatch, they are only six-legged. And um, yeah, so that, that kind of is confusing, but then they grow another pair <laughs> of legs. And um, Sean did ask me about deer kids, and you can see why it is very confusing and why people might think that a deer kid could be a tick. Um, because of course they look very similar at this particular um, um, when they've been blown up like this. But I got in touch with one of our tick ecologists, whose name is Dr. Dan Salkeld, and he's on our science advisory board. And he's one of the people who's done a lot of work um, dragging for ticks uh, in California over the years. And I said, hey, Dan, what do you know about deer kids? And uh, he's living in Spain right now, but he got right back to me and he said, absolutely nothing. I know nothing about deer kids. So, I got on Google and I did a little Googling and again, you know, you always have to be careful um, when you just Google unsupervised. Um, but it looks to me like um, deer kids, they can bite you and they can cause a nasty uh, bite bite, uh, which may be very itchy and might be a bit painful. But as far as I could make out, they um, even though they may host pathogens um, and bacteria, it, not very often that they vector those or transmit them to humans. So that seems to be a question mark as to whether they actually can do that to humans or not. But I did notice that they, like other insects and particularly ticks, are really uh, increasing in population. So yeah. we'll then, talk about protecting yourselves from those as well as ticks. They're, yeah. they're actually wingless flies is what they are. Yes, yeah. So when they've got their wings, I think, that you can see them better and you'll be able to see that whether they're a tick or not. But um, my advice would be always carry a magnifying, a little magnifying glass maybe in your kit when you're out outside in the field um, so that you know what you're looking at if you get bitten. So let's talk about Lyme disease. What is it? Um, Lyme is a bacterial infection. 
as we know, transmitted by a tick bite. It's, it's known scientifically as a spirochete because it has this very distinctive corkscrew shape appearance under the microscope. And it's a very clever and wily little beastie because this corkscrew shape is what makes it particularly nefarious in that once it gets into your bloodstream, it doesn't really like hanging out in the bloodstream for very long. It really wants to migrate into the deep tissues of the body. And this corkscrew um, attribute enables it to actually do that and drill into the joints and the deep tissues of the body if you don't catch it and get treated early. So um, it's called Lyme because this particular um, bacteria was identified uh, back in 1975 in Lyme, Connecticut, where there was an outbreak of what people thought originally was juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but this chap here, Dr. Willie Bergdorfer, is the person who identified the spirochete, which is why its scientific name is Borrelia burgdorferi after him. And um, it does cause, in the early stage, the acute stage of the disease, an acute flu-like illness, um, which is why it's important, especially here in California, if you have an unseasonal bout of the flu, like in the late spring or summer or early fall, that should be a, a trigger for you to think, well, could it be Lyme? So here's some facts. Um, Lyme is actually the fastest growing vector-borne infectious disease in the United States today. There are approximately half a million new cases a year. Um, this is data is from the CDC. And we have cases have been reported in all 50 states, which is different than saying there's infected ticks in all 50 states, because as you know, people like ourselves, we travel, we travel to hunt, we travel to recreate, we travel to camp, all these different things, go through hiking, et cetera. And so you could you know, travel and pick up a tick in another state, but not get sick until you get back to California or your home state. And then that's where the actual case is reported, which is why uh, we can say that it's been reported in all 50 states. Um, the Western black-legged tick, which is the particular tick we're going to focus on today, has been recorded in 58, 55 of the 58 California counties. Um, as we know, if you're out there, you're particularly at risk. Uh, unfortunately, it's frequently misdiagnosed by doctors, especially out here on the West Coast, because they just aren't trained for it in medical school. They don't see an awful lot of cases, especially as sort of general practitioners. And so it's, it's just not that something that they're really attuned to. Um, but the big problem is that even after you've been treated for Lyme in the acute stage, um, as, ma as many as 30% of patients may develop uh, ongoing health issues after having been treated, which is uh, a big problem. Yeah, I got a lot of stories uh, come in that people are saying they had extended uh, issues with, with Lyme. Yeah. And unlike other parts of the country where uh, the, the emergence of the ticks is a very seasonal thing, um, you know, in the upper Midwest and in the Northeastern United States where, you know, we still have um, Kind of cold and the ticks go into the dirt and they sort of either hibernate and a lot of them get killed off over the winter and then they kind of emerge in the spring. Uh, tick, tick season is year round in California so you need to be vigilant all the time in California especially that two times of the year. In the fall after the first rain because ticks love moisture they get activated by humidity and then in the springtime, when the nymphal ticks hatch, that's also a, a particularly peak time for being bitten by a tick in California. So those are your two key times out here. Uh, Joe, I don't yeah. know we didn't cover this, but it's a question. Somebody yeah. wanted to know why the prevalence was so high in the Northeast. 
Is it because of that humidity factor, the moisture factor, or more ticks, or? Um, it's really, it's really a, a, it's just that, it's like compound interest. It's that cumulative effect. If you have lots of mammal that are like deer who are the reservoirs for the Borrelia bacteria and those mammals are moving around and humans are also uh, living in highly wooded areas. And so um, the in the Northeast, you know, you get a lot of uh, subdivisions where there's a lot of people planted a lot of trees or they built houses uh, in and around forests and woodland. Yeah. And so it's that combination of the fact that the disease reservoir is much greater. And so you have that multiplier effect, but also because humans are moving more and more into habitats and have over the last, you know, I suppose 50, 60 years, and we're moving more and more into those suburban habitats where those are tick habitats and deer and small mammal habitats. Thank you. So I know Sean had a, what I like to call the rogues gallery of ticks up <laughs> at the beginning of this, um, this webinar, but in California, um, I've indicated the six ticks that are of particular, uh, th these are the ones that can bite humans and can vector diseases to humans. Um, there are other ticks nationally that you do need to be aware of, like the Lone Star tick here. This is the Eastern black-legged tick, which is the closest cousin, or the deer tick, close cousin, I should see to the Western black-legged tick. There's the Gulf Coast tick, and there are other soft ticks, and so many other ticks that are out there. But this is kind of the the big group, and I've really tried to focus here on the California tick. Um, so tick-borne diseases, the Western black-legged tick. One of the reasons why we really focus on this particular uh, tick is not just because of Lyme, but this tick could actually. Uh, vector or transmit to you up to six different pathogens in one bite. So that's why um, it's of particular concern out here in California. And then the others are the, the dog ticks, um, the American dog tick, the Rocky, uh, and then the brown dog tick. I've just kind of shown one here because they are very similar. And then also the Rocky Mountain wood tick. And, but the Western black-legged tick actually can vector up to six of these first um, diseases out here, with the big focus obviously being on Lyme disease. Um, there's also another kind of Borrelia, which is the Borrelia miyamotoi out here in California, which causes um, quite sort of interesting wrinkles in terms of diagnostics here. I put an asterisk by Bartonella or Bartonellosis because what happens is when people get tested and they test positive for Lyme and what we call these co-infections, Bartonella or Bartonellosis will often come up uh, in concert with Lyme and these other diseases like Babesiosis. But we've never been able to really figure out how the ticks vector this to humans. So that's why there's an asterisk there. It just happens that people who get Lyme very often will, will get Bartonella as well. But Bartonella is actually vectored to humans as well by, by fleas. So if you have cats and dogs, this is why it's really important that you stay on top of your, um, you know, pick and flea meds for your animals because uh, Bartonella is a very, very unpleasant uh, disease. And so you know, just be aware of that one too. Anything where you're around your, your dogs and cats, stay on top of it. Um, but in other states, um, ticks can also vector these other diseases. They're not like right here in California right now, but they are problematic and very nasty and can cause things like um, brain encephalitis, you know, like encephalitis, brain swelling, and, um, Additionally, this is a relatively new thing that can happen with a tick bite. This can be a lone star tick, can um, bite you and cause an allergy to uh, meat. 
And we actually had this come in as a question in advance and someone said, is this true? And it's like, yes, it is true. You can Google it and you can go find information about this on the CDC website. Um, so these are the big ones. So I'm going to get a little bit more out of that part of just like talking about prevention a little bit, because that's really why a lot of people are here. Um, the big problem is, as you can see, the tips, they're really small. This one usually gets a wow when I talk to people in person because these are larval ticks and you can see how absolutely tiny they are and how easy it would be to miss them if you are, you've been out and about, you wouldn't know that you'd even got these ticks on you. And they're so difficult to detect for that reason. And that's why um, Somewhere around 40 to 50% of people who are diagnosed with Lyme, they don't ever recall seeing a tick or even seeing a bite or having a rash on themselves. So that, or seeing like a, the place where the tick bit them. And the transmission times for ticks actually um, ingesting warm mammalian blood, which is what they have to have in order to you know, get to that next stage of their life cycle. It's this warm, live mammalian blood that actually activates the Borrelia or the spirochetes and this bacteria in the mid gut of the tick. And um, depending on so many different factors that we don't really fully understand, uh, you know, if you go onto websites, they'll say, oh, a tick doesn't really have to be attached to you for more than 24 hours, 36 hours, 72 hours before you have to worry about uh, catching anything. And that's actually not entirely true. So what we say at Bay Area Lyme Foundation is that the potential is that there really is no safe time period for a tick to be attached to you. And that's because um, some ticks, that we kind of see as like super infective. You know, we all know the concept of a super spreader. We know that now from COVID, the idea of a super spreader event. Sometimes the bacteria can actually be in the salivary glands of the tick or, um, you know, get transmitted very early during the feeding process. So that's why um, it's really important to just like pay attention. These ticks, probably have been feeding for about three days. And that's when oftentimes you'll take a shower and you'll you'll feel this. The, the fingertip test is very often the thing that actually makes people realize they've got a tick on them. And they'll be in the shower and they'll suddenly say, oh, wow, I've got, is this a mole or is this a skin tag? And then they'll look at it. And that's when they discover they've got a tick on them. So let's talk about Lyme and the visual signs of Lyme disease. Um, if you get an expanding rash, anywhere from three days to a month uh, after you've had a tick bite that's larger than about five centimeters, um, we call this the erythema migrans, and it's called migrans because it's expanding or migrating. And it can be round, oval, very irregular shaped. Um, this rash is not normally itchy or painful, but it can be warmed. So this way is where it, you differentiate it from like the cad bite. And very often um, this could be misdiagnosed as a spider bite or cellulitis. Um, this kind of rash can also be confused with allergic reactions to tick bites because believe it or not, some people are allergic to tick saliva. <laughs> and so this adds a further layer of complication to the whole tick bite scenario. But these allergic reactions typically occur within about 24 hours of the bite and they don't spread. So if you get a spreading kind of rash, that should be an alert for you to seek treatment. The challenge is that the rash doesn't appear on everybody who's been exposed to Lyme. Uh, uh, you know, maybe like 30% of people don't get any kind of a rash at all. And out here in California, it's further complicated by the fact that this bacteria, the Borrelia meiomotoi, which is a, um, a different species of Borrelia, this particular one um, is even less frequently associated with rashes. So that's also a thing to add another layer of complexity. So 
the the but the bottom line is you should be alert to expanding rashes okay this is the classic bullseye rash that looks like the target logo which most doctors out here will look at this and go oh that's a tick bite the problem is that this is a much more common rash from a tick bite and you might look at that and go i have no idea what this is and um, also some rashes have a sort of blue kind of cast to them. And then here, this is when um, somebody is showing multiple rashes or, uh, and this is where the um, bacteria has actually started to disseminate or spread in the body. Um, so that is a big sign that you should get yourself to the doctor. And to uh, confirm yeah. those aren't multiple bites, those are just the bacteria. Yeah, moving. this is the bacteria moving around, disseminating in the body, yeah. So um, I'm, I could have done this as a broken down slide, but I decided to leave it up um, just so that, you know, if you wanna take a screenshot or you wanna come back to it later, the early or acute phase of Lyme, um, again, to repeat, like flu-like symptoms, headache, fever, chill, fatigue, maybe a lymph node swell up, you might have a bit of joint pain. Um, this might take you to the doctor, you know, you might think to yourself, especially if it's not flu season and you've been out in the field, even if you didn't see a tick, this should be, or get a bite, you should think about that. If the um, acute phase is not um, treated within weeks, to months of exposure, you could move to the disseminated stage where the Borrelia bacteria, it's, it's migrated out of your bloodstream now and it's now gone into the deep tissues of your body. They really like, the Borrelia is not particularly sociable. It's just going to go and make a home in the joint in the deep, deep tissues. And there, this is when it will often raise its ugly head because you might start to experience swelling or like arthritis type symptoms in one or more joints. People will often find that their one of their knees starts to swell up. You might also experience like a Bell's palsy type of thing, a fallen face, maybe numbing, numbing, tingling, shooting pains in your arms and legs. And in about, uh, you know, less than 10% of cases, you might even get sort of like a tachycardia type heart rhythm issue. And then again, if it's left untreated uh, within months to years of exposure, you're gonna get very severe musculoskeletal problems. This may put you in a wheelchair, cause a lot of issues with um, ambulatory problems and also tremendous uh, problems with uh, brain fog, people describe it as neurological problems and uh, you know, it gets very, very hard. It's very debilitating. People find that they can't work and uh, they're really very, very compromised and very debilitated by Lyme if it's left to do its own thing. So let's talk about what to do if you get bitten. Um, if you get bitten or you start developing symptoms, you should prevent Lyme by seeing a doctor as soon as possible. And ask for antibiotic, uh, particularly, ask specifically for doxycycline, um, and ask for a minimum of 21 days, because doxycycline is a specific antibiotic aimed at anti-replication. Because what you want to do is you want to stop this bacteria while it's still in your bloodstream. So getting on top of this in the acute phase of the illness is really critical because if you get on doxycycline, this is where you stand the greatest chance of stopping the bacteria from replicating and killing or knocking it back in your system. But even after you have been treated, it's imperative you monitor yourself the symptoms even after you've had the antibiotics. This is actually a photograph of a uh, the thigh of someone I went hiking with, it was actually one of my uh, daughter's friends, and he developed this rash and also um, an allergic reaction to the thigh. So he got the double sign that he had Lyme. He was very lucky he got straight on antibiotics because this is clearly an unequivocal issue that he was infected with Lyme. And the good news is he got the 21 days of doxy and he is now perfectly fine. 
So what is the issue with this problem with diagnosis? Um, why don't we have a reliable diagnostic test? The issue is, is that if you have 100 people with Lyme and only 50% of them have a rash or see a tick, and then of that 50%, only 50% see a doctor, the current test that we have out there um, unfortunately misses about 60% of the positive cases of Lyme. So this is why knowing the symptoms and being able to advocate for yourself is so critical. And because of the fact that we currently don't have a great diagnostic test available, and this is a really big issue for doctors, so we, do, we can't blame the medical profession for not being able to diagnose the Lyme effectively when there is not a reliable diagnostic test out there that's sensitive enough to really pick up all the cases. The problem is, is that the average Lyme patient sees about five doctors over two years before being correctly diagnosed which, and, and this, there are many, many people that we see in this kind of state, unfortunately, because of the lack of a reliable and accurate diagnostic test. And because of this, when doctors don't have the ability to have a sensitive test and people are coming to them, just regular primary care physicians, and the way that the disease presents itself is so different depending on how your body reacts to this infection. Um, the doctor, him or herself, may have never actually seen a case of Lyme, particularly out here in California. We get a lot of misdiagnoses, uh, flu, viral infection, Epstein-Barr virus. Many people get uh, diagnosed as having chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, which is sort of like referred and un, you know, unidentifiable pain, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, thyroid disorders, ALS. And then as it progresses and people start to have a lot of neurological issues, you know, they may even be um, diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's. These three things at the bottom in green, I highlight these because if you have a child, a school-aged child that you take out camping, hiking, fishing, whatever it is, mountain biking, you're out there having fun, but all of a sudden they begin to display very unusual behaviors to the point where you think they may suddenly, like a sudden onset of psychiatric disorders or learning disabilities, don't discount the fact that they could have been bitten by a tick and it may actually be Lyme because we hear of these cases all the time. And again, early treatment is absolutely critical um, for kids. So let's talk about prevention. <laughs> let's get to the what can we do about this problem. The great thing is, is that treating your clothing with this relatively cheap uh, insecticide called permethrin uh, is incredibly effective in that if you spray this on your pants, your long sleeve shirts, your shoes, your socks, your jacket, et cetera, your hat, ticks will die very, very quickly after they uh, come into contact with this particular uh, insecticide. And uh, it is harmless to humans. You can do it yourself for under $10. <laughs> Or if you are the kind of person who uses the same clothing a lot and you wash it a lot, think about getting your clothing treated professionally through this particular company. It's called Insect Shield. And you can send your clothes away and they will treat your clothes for you and send them back. And then they are good for, they say, about 70, 70 washes. If you're treating your clothing yourself, um, it says on the product that it's probably about seven washes before you have to retreat your uh, outdoor gear, okay? And this is a very, very effective way of protecting yourself. The other way to protect yourself is to protect your exposed skin. Never use this permethrin on exposed skin. This is for treating uh, fabric only. But if you're using uh, any kind of repellent on yourself, please consider using something that has more than 20% DEET. And if you're looking at using a more na natural base like lemon eucalyptus oil or the different kinds of 
um, product out there, please check uh, in advance and look up from these particular agencies because they give you a lot of data about the length of the e efficacy of the more natural products. And these natural products can be very effective, but you may have to apply them more frequently. The other thing is, is that if you're using sunscreen as well as a natural repellent, uh, you may find that the sunscreen actually reduces the efficacy of the repellent. So you do need to pay attention to that too, unfortunately. And then for you hunters yeah. out there worried about yeah. the scent or smell, the permethrin is odorless. Uh, so it shouldn't affect like, you know, letting uh, deer know in the area that you're there. Uh, you have to worry more about your own scent than the, the permethrin being. Uh, uh, yeah, cause. that's a really good point, Sean. Thanks for bringing that up. The other great thing about permethrin is it will kill all those other things as well, like chiggers and mites and mosquitoes. And um, I would hope those Kevs, it says biting flies. So I'm just going to throw those into the pot. <laughs> so let's just kill all of them. Okay. <laughs> so let's learn about the correct way to remove a tick. And we did kind of cover this at the beginning on Sean's uh, slide, but um, it's very import important that you grasp the tick as close to the skin as possible, right where the mouth parts are. Okay. Because you want to try and get those mouth parts out. And um, please use needle nose tweezers, those really skinny knees, needle nose tweezers or a tick removal tool because the flat headed tweezers, the problem with those is you could inadvertently snap the head off the tick and you, you don't wanna do that. So you pull firmly, gently away from the skin. Please don't like yank or twist the tick because you could end up shocking the tick. And those of you who pull ticks out, you know, they don't like it. As soon as they know that they're getting attacked from that uh, meal, they, they, they start wiggling their, their legs frantically. And they're like, no, 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 I really want that meal. And you see, but don't, don't yank them or twist them because you don't want to shock them. If you shock them, where the bacteria and the pathogens and the parasites and things like that tend to hang out is in the mid gut of the tick. And if you shock the tick, the tick may actually regurgitate the entire contents of its midgut into your bloodstream. So that's completely defeating the object of how you're trying to get it off you without uh, it doing that. And please avoid any of these alternative methods that a lot of kid, people did when they were kids out here, but don't do it. Don't put Vaseline on the tick. Don't scrape it with a credit card. Please do not put a lip match under the tick. Don't do any of those things because you could cause it to do that regurgitation. And the very important thing is if you are lucky enough to see the tick, you're lucky enough to pull the tick off of yourself. If you are unlucky and it gets embedded, please save the tick for testing. And what you do is you put it in a Ziploc bag with a piece of moist paper towel or something like that to keep it, stop it from desiccating uh, because you can get the tick tested and you would be able then to find out if that tick was actually harboring any kind of bacteria or virus or parasite or pathogen that might cause illness. Um, the other practical tips are to wear lighter colored clothing. I understand if you're out there in camo, this is a stretch, which is even more reason to treat those kinds of garments with permethrin. If you're wearing long pants and sleeves, please tuck your pants into socks. Uh, when you come home, one of the tips is to run your clothing through the dryer before you wash your clothes. Uh, this may or may not be popular in your household. It's just a suggestion um, because if you dry your clothing, that will desiccate and dry out the tick because um, it's been shown that about 50% of ticks can actually survive hot water uh, washes. And, you know, you don't want that to happen. You want to kill them. But if you've been around poison oak, please don't run your uh, clothing through the dryer because then you might have to buy a new dryer and we don't want to have you do that. <laughs> um, 
So the next thing is to know where to look for them on your body. Um, there's a lot of information out there, but what we know from uh, from people who've like self-reported and sent ticks in to one of the tick testing labs that I'm going to show you is that the head, hair, upper leg, and thighs seem to be the places, interestingly, where ticks seem to be found the most frequently. But here are the other places all over, back, lower legs, ears, folds of the neck, armpits, waistband, groin. These are the places where traditionally we've found ticks or told people to look for ticks because if they crawl up inside your pant legs, they're going to reach your belt or the waistband of your pants and then they'll just embed there where they're constricted and they can't go any further. But it's important to check your pets too because ticks can be hitchhikers. But check for ticks every single day when you're in the shower. Again, that fingertip test, check every nook and cranny. If you find something weird, take a closer look in the mirror or have your, your loved one or your partner take a look for you, okay? Um, you're out there with our canine companions. This is very challenging, especially if you have uh, a black dog or a dog with very dark fur, um, but you need to be checking your animals for ticks and make sure you are staying on top of those tick and flea meds. If your dog is unlucky enough to get bitten, some of the symptoms may be swollen lymph nodes, fever, painful joints and muscles and lameness that seems to wax and wane and move around from one leg to another. So be alert to that if you've got your dog out there with you in the field, especially if you have a dog that's trained, a dog that's trained to the gun and is going through all of those bushes and undergrowth, et cetera. So here's where to get ticks tested. They, all these guys are great. Uh, tick report, that information about where people are self-reporting, head, hair and the upper thigh, upper legs, that you can go online and you can see some great charts and data from them about where people are finding ticks. But this is where if you save the ticks, you send the ticks into these people, they will let you know if the tick was infected with anything. And they have a variety of different pricing depending on the number of pathogens you want to be asking them to test for. So I'm not really gonna get into that here. So we're just gonna summarize, prevention tip summary. Take those ticks off of your cells immediately. Save them for testing, treat your clothing with permethrin, use more than 20% of DEET on any exposed skin, tuck your hair up into a hat, wear long sleeve shirts and pants. And if you can do it, run your clothing through hot dryer 10 or 15 minutes before you wash. But the most important thing is to check yourself for ticks every day. And then if you're in, unfortunate enough to get bitten or think you may have been bitten, know the symptoms, watch for symptoms and insist on early treatment. Okay, I think that's it. Go to the doctor and make sure you get that doxycycline. And there's a ton information. There's more information than you could possibly have ever wanted about Lyme on our website, bayarealime.org. And there is also a wealth of information about uh, protecting yourselves and your family and preventing tick bites from, uh, on our website as well. So. Great. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, I think we handled all the questions as they came in. You have a little brief moment here before we end the webinar. Um, if no questions uh, and you want to see this, this is being recorded. You can watch it again in the future or share it with uh, other loved ones who are out there in the field um, and try to prevent them from getting bitten by, uh, by uh, ticks. So uh, at that, nothing's coming in. Joe, I think you did a very thorough job. Everybody's probably happy. We still have the same audience numbers that we started with. So Thank you for That's sticking great. with us. Yes, Good thank job. you. And, thank you uh, so much. Just want to tell everybody I feel very blessed to be here uh, doing this with you. 
uh, I hope the information is fruitful to you and hopefully it prevents you from having any issues uh, with Lyme disease in the future. Ticks, uh, they look ugly for a reason. They kind of screen people out. Uh, you know, they, they, they're not fun. So, but hopefully if you have one, you can prevent it from biting you. And if you get bit, please take all the precautions necessary to uh, avoid, you know, the illnesses that come associated with Lyme disease yeah. and their other disease. Thanks. Uh, and before we close, I, I just want to do a little plug for Bay Area Lyme Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, a national nonprofit. And every single dollar that's donated to Bay Area Lyme Foundation goes to research and prevention programs. Um, so if you feel moved uh, to donate to our cause, you can do that and help us out by supporting all of this amazing uh, research scientists and labs we have around the country, getting to these answers. Uh, our goal is to make Lyme easy to diagnose and simple to cure, and we are getting very close to being Great. able to do that. Thank well, you. Be nice if it was easy to diagnose, but thank it you. It would be, yeah. Everybody have a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And uh, look forward to a next another uh, you know webinar hopefully early in this next year. I appreciate your time and thank you for coming here and joining us. Good night. Thank you, Joe. Good night. Thank you. Good night.